Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar for the improvements to saferproducts.gov Section 15B reporting system. This webinar focus specifically is going to be on participating in the Fast Track Recall Program. My name is Phil Bermel. I'm an Assistant Division Director at the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, specifically the supervisor of the Fast Track Program. And hi, everybody. I'm Shelby Mathis. I'm the Small Business Ombudsman at the Consumer Product Safety Commission and have the pleasure of working with Phil in that capacity. Uh, before we get started today, I, I feel like we've all been living for a year in this pandemic with all of these uh, online tools to deliver webinar content, but I just want to walk you through a little bit of the, uh, the tools on the right-hand side of your screen. So as we present today, you may have questions. You can submit those to us using the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. You should have a questions box or a chat box, uh, depending on what type of web browser you're using or what type of computer you're using. You can submit those questions via the questions or chat box right to us, and we're gonna be addressing questions at the end of the session. Also, uh, on the right-hand toolbar, you'll see there's a handout section. So uh, we always get the question, can we get the slides for today? The answer is yes. The good news is that the slides for today are attached as a handout, uh, as a PDF on the right-hand side toolbar, and you have the ability to download uh, the PDF of those slides. So um, that, I think that's all the functionality. I'm gonna turn it back over to Phil uh, to get us started with today's presentation. Thank you, Shelby. Today's presentation is gonna be done in two parts. I will start off um, and then Shelby will finish up. Disclaimer is that this presentation was prepared by CPSC staff and may not necessarily reflect the views of the commission. So today's presentation is on the improvements to saferproducts.gov Section 15B reporting system. Now, with uh, the focus today, will be on participating in the Fast Track Recall Program. However, we will add additional information on aspects of this presentation that pertain to non Fast Track. However, the main focus will be Fast Track. When I arrived at the Consumer Product Safety Commission two years ago, I recognized that the online reporting system was a bit bulky. For firms wanting to use saferproducts.gov and report an initial report, there was a lot of information that was required up front. What we did over the last two years was broke, break down that information according to the regulation. What we wanted to do here was create a more clear roadmap for firms that encourage them to utilize the online reporting system. How we broke it down is that reports will now be submitted in two parts. Everyone's familiar with the initial report section. This meets the section 15 reporting obligation. All cases will be required to submit an initial report. What we've done with this initial report is we've streamlined the information required. We're requiring the information specifically laid out in the regulation and what we realized is that information does not have to be very lengthy. After that initial report, we're then requiring additional information to be submitted after the fact. This is a requirement for fast track cases. It will be phased in as a requirement for fast track that all users utilize this online portal for eligibility to participate in the fast track program. Some other upgrades that we've included are the streamlined interface, the hoverovers providing additional descriptions of information that we're requesting firms to provide us. We're giving you more definitions. This will help you understand the specific information that we are asking for and be better able to provide it to us. We're also giving you a menu on the left-hand side of the page, which I'll show you on the next slide, which clearly shows your progress in the submission of information. We wanted users to be able to submit information in an organized manner with added user ability. Additional functionality that we've included 
is we have made this mobile friendly. You will be able to use this new recording tool on a mobile phone or a tablet, which currently is not able to be done in the current portal. Inside the new portal, you'll be able to edit the press releases template. In addition, the, inf the additional information section as well. At the end of submitting the initial report, you can also download a PDF copy of the report as well. We've made attachments easier to submit and included system prompts supplying the required documents. For example, depending on the type of recall that you're proposing with CPSC, different documentation is required. And the specific documents that are required will be more clearly laid out. Also, auto-generated emails and reminders will also be sent to submitters. These reminders consist of a confirmation of submission, a reminder of upcoming deadlines for the case, case number and the name and contact information for the compliance officer assigned. Also, auto-generated press release templates that will be pre-populated with the information that you enter into the system. Up on the screen now is saferproducts.gov. For those who regularly use the online reporting portal, this page is familiar to you. If a, if a user is not logged into the business portal, this is the page that they will see. On the right-hand side, we've made that blue box saying report a potentially unsafe product a little bit larger. That's the main button for clicking for starting the initial report. Again, the button on the left, register, will remain there. And for anyone who doesn't have a business account, they're able to register at that time. We do realize that a, there is a large benefit for being registered with saferproducts.gov. The major benefit is that information will be pre-populated. You'll be able to access account history and update information about your firm. Once you select on report a potentially unsafe product, you'll be brought to the first page of the initial report submission. Now I understand this page is completely new. This first step in the initial report deals with product description. First, I wanna go through the layout of this new initial report portal. On the left-hand side, that is a menu showing your progress from top to bottom. The yellow dots show what step you're currently on and subsequent dots below show how you will progress through the initial report. As we move to the questions in the middle, starting with product description, you'll see a red asterisk. What that denotes is that is a required field. Moving down to brand name, you'll also see that's a required field as well. And if there are additional brand names or model names or numbers, we've added the functionality of clicking just below that text box and allowing you to add more. We've added this functionality to not clutter the screen, but also provide users the greatest functionality in using this portal. Also, what we've tried to do here is follow the exact order of the regulation. After filling out product description, you'll then move on to the manufacturer, importer, or retailer page. The entry at the top should be the primary entity reporting. As you can see, manufacturer, importer, retailer has a red asterisk, so it will be required. Immediately next to that red asterisk is a hover over, question mark. When a user hovers the mouse over that, additional information will appear. We've added these into any field where we feel there could be confusion or additional clarification is needed. Also, 
just below that pop-up, there's another add manufacturer, importer, retailer option. We've added the functionality of including multiple in there while also denoting on the left by checking boxes for which entity that is. Down below the required information dealing with address and telephone, following the contact person, name, title, and email address. Moving on in the initial report, the hazard information asks first off for a hazard description. This is a required field given the asterisks. Again, with a hover over to better explain what exactly we're asking for. Don't be afraid that this appears to be a small text box. We allow users to submit an explanation of up to 500 words in this box to explain what their hazard description is or could be. Just below that, we have a primary hazard. Users who have used the current business portal are familiar with this tab, and the options for the hazard dropdown remain the same. We no longer request users to enter in a secondary hazard. Just to the right, certification standards information. If your product was required to meet certain safety certification or standards, we're going to ask you to enter in that information there from the drop down. If it's not applicable, there's a box that you can click on the right. Just below that, if you're reporting a potential violation of a mandatory safety standard, users are able to check a box yes or no. This lets us in compliance loop in our regulated compliance team as necessary. Moving on in the initial report to the nature and extent of the injury, this page requires users to enter in the total number of incidents, injuries, and deaths. Now located at the top, this information should include only numbers that have occurred within the United States. Now for those total number of incidents, injuries, and deaths, those are required numbers. And we ask that users submit the most accurate and up-to-date numbers that they know at the time of submission. However, there are instances where individuals do not know these, this information. And we've provided a checkbox on the right for users to more clearly indicate that. There are hoverovers, those question marks with circles, provided next to each line to give users a better idea of the specific scope of information that we are asking for. When you do enter in a number for injuries or deaths that's greater than zero, a text box below will appear. The reason for this is if injuries or deaths have occurred, more information on those situations are required. So we ask that you provide additional information in those text boxes. Again, the boxes do appear small on the screen. However, you are able to enter in a fairly large amount of information. Continuing on in the initial report, the contact information of the indiv individual filing the report. For consultants and attorneys, their law firm contact information would go here. If you are a business portal registered user, you can check the box at the top and information will pre-populate. If so, users will see this page. Continuing on to the acknowledgement page in the initial report. At first, there is a confidentiality agreement for checking that box. 
And the next question, would you like to proceed in the fast track recall program? This is a major fork in the road in our process. Checking no means that you wish to go non-fast track. Checking yes means that you would like to participate in the fast track program. Take your eyes and slide them to the right side of the screen. To participate in the fast track recall program, a business must be prepared to implement a corrective action plan, including a consumer level recall. This is a refund, repair, or replacement. In addition, the firm must immediately stop sale and distribution of the product. These are requirements in the fast track program. Down below additional comments, we've provided that text box for firms to provide us with any additional information if they are not on a clear path to either fast track or non fast track. This helps compliance better understand the situation and if additional conversation is necessary, that then can happen. After selecting yes or no and or providing additional comments, a pop-up will appear. This pop-up will appear if you have selected to go fast track. And this pop-up says submitting through this system is not considered an admission of the existence of a substantial product hazard or a violation of a mandatory safety standard. Again, a benefit of going fast track. As you can see, this is the review and submission page on the initial report. If you look back left to the vertical column, you you can clearly see that you have completed all six of six steps in the initial report. Also, you can review the information in front of you to see if everything is correct. At this point, you have the option to edit that information if you wish. You can either click on edit on the right hand side or you can click on the left hand side column on a specific line and you'll be taken to that line. In doing that, no information will be lost in the process. We wanted to make sure that we minimized the likelihood of having to re-enter information when going back to edit things. Again, at the bottom, there is a checkbox that you acknowledge the information upon submission. And then located at the bottom, there are two checkboxes that are possible to be selected. On the left, it says you have chosen fast track. That edit button next to that allows you the ability, if at this point you wish not to go fast track, to change that. However, if you do wish to continue forward in the fast track program, that blue button, submit initial report and proceed to fast track, is the button that you should hit. At this point in the process, your fast track initial report has been submitted. A copy of that report has been sent to the email address that was provided. On this page, the report number will populate along with the date submitted. You have the option on the, on the upper download report button to download a PDF copy of the report here. Also, just below that, if you have, you are at the point of the process where you would like to continue as you've completed the initial report and you'd like to continue on to complete and fulfill the additional information, you have that option here. If users are have not registered as a business, they also have that option here. Register your company with us as this button. And if someone is not registered, this is the page that will come up. And that is a summary and a review of the initial report process. This time, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Shelby Mathis, who will go through the additional information. Thank you so much, Phil. Now I'm off mute. 
Uh, let me make sure. I think we're good to go. Excellent. All right. So um, Phil did a fantastic job of walking you through the initial report, and he talked about the fact that there was a fork in the road there. And for today's presentation, we're just going to focus on uh, what you're going to see if you select yes, you want to proceed in fast track, and you submit that initial report. If you have all the information uh, for a what's traditionally called a full report in the regulation, and you're ready to proceed, then this is the first page you're going to see. And it's a checklist of information that we need you to gather, that we're going to be expecting you to supply. And let me just walk through a few of these. We thought um, it best to give you a heads up on what's coming in terms of uh, future requests for information on subsequent pages with a checklist. So the first thing is we're going to ask you details of the stop sale of the product. This is a requirement to be in the Fast Track program. Uh, and we'll see in subsequent slides what more details we need on the stop sale. But just a heads up, you're going to need to gather those details to submit them to us. We'd also uh, need information about the notification measures that have been taken with consumers, the distribution chain, and others. We'll ask for information about product details, including the brand name and model number. You've certainly already submitted those at the initial report stage. If there are more that you realize are also involved in the Section 15B report, now's the time to include those. You'll also see there's more information uh, that you can submit serial numbers, UPC codes, date codes, those sorts of things uh, to look for on the product. We'll also uh, be talking about product distribution information, including whether the product was distributed in Canada or Mexico. Why is this information important to ask as you're submitting your additional information in subsequent pages? Well, because it impacts the press release that goes out to the public and it uh, cues us within the Office of Compliance to know that we need to work with our partners at Health Canada and Profeco to communicate this recall to the public at large. We'll also uh, need some information on the hazard. You've entered some preliminary information about the hazard at the initial report stage, but this is gonna be more in-depth information. We'll also need to know what remedy you're selecting. If there's more than one, you have three options here, a refund, a repair, or a replacement and we'll talk about in more detail what is needed depending on which remedy uh, you select. If you select all of them, we'll talk about what's required there. We'll also need information about recall notices that you plan to post and where you plan to post them in terms of websites and social media platforms. You also need to gather product photos. This is a requirement that comes straight from the regulation for a full report. All submissions uh, for Fast Track are gonna require a product photo so you'll have the ability to upload those at the end of this system. And depending on the remedy that you've selected, we'll also need technical documents and or consumer instructions could be required. Now we've got the notice at the bottom before we proceed that says, uh, just a heads up, you're gonna have the ability to provide additional attachments. So this is a, a bit of a lengthy checklist. If there are more attachments that you have, maybe more information about injuries or deaths that you want to make sure we get, that's going to be on the attachments page. And we're going to do our best there to cue you as to what we're looking for from you in order to be able to process this case very quickly. And as Phil mentioned, um, one of the benefits of this new system is we are going to be populating, as you complete each of these screens, a press release template. And I'll talk more about what that means in just a moment, um, that you'll be able to see a draft press release before you submit all this additional information to the CPSC. All right, so this is the first screen within the additional information section for Fast Track. As Phil mentioned, we've got the menu bar running along the left-hand side of the screen. You'll see this is a little bit different than the initial report where we had six steps. Now we have nine. I mean, that makes sense. If you look at our regs, 1115.13 C and D, you'll see there's a, there's a difference in the length there on what's required for an initial report, which is really meant to fulfill your Section 15B reporting obligation to us right at the outset to do so very quickly. And what's required in terms of more uh, wholesome, toothsome, if you will, information on the actual hazard and how many products are involved for us to be able to process your case. And today, specifically, we're focused on fast track. So the first screen that you're going to see is a question on whether or not you've stopped sale. And it's a yes or no question. 
as Phil mentioned, the red asterisk denote fields that are required to be answered to proceed to the next screen. And the question marks are hover over text. So in this case, there's a question mark. That hover over text, if you moved your mouse over it, would say stopping sale of the product means that you have notified everyone in your manufacturing and supply chain to stop sale. So depending on how you answer this product, or answer, sorry, this question on whether or not you've stopped sale of the product, you could see a pop-up. If you say no, this is a pop-up message that will appear on your screen. Stopping sale is a requirement to participate in the fast track program. You've stopped sale if the consumer product is no longer available for purchase by an end consumer and all inventory in the distribution chain has been quarantined to prevent it from reaching consumers. So after seeing that pop up, if you realize I haven't stopped sale of the product, you aren't eligible to enter the fast track program because that's a requirement of entering fast track is stopping sale. So you would close out that pop up message and stop sale of the product and come back to this system to supply additional information and be able to select yes on whether or not you've stopped sale. So just to be clear, if you select no, I have not stopped sale of the product, you will not be able to advance to future screens. One of the benefits of setting up this system with the rules that we're putting in place is we're actually building in guardrails uh, to make sure that when you submit information to the CPSC and you think you've submitted a report to be eligible to be in Fast Track, that you've given us everything we need in the form that we need it in order to process your case. So hopefully you're able to select yes on stopped sale so that you can proceed on these screens. Once you select yes, just as Phil indicated, you'll see We've tried to keep these screens as clutter-free as possible, uh, but if you, depending on the answer that you supply, you'll see that additional questions stack beneath it. And this appears quite well on a tablet or a phone. Uh, obviously, it works great on a desktop or a laptop computer, but for a smaller screen, um, the group that is building this system has done a really good job of making sure that it uh, is is very clean on the screen and it's clear what you're selecting here. So if you select yes for stopping sale of the product, we're going to ask you, does that mean you've stopped retail sale or you stopped online sale? For purposes of this demonstration, we've assumed that you stopped a retail sale and we'll ask you to enter a date. And the reason there's a little calendar box there, you have two options and completing fields like this. You can manually type in a date if you know it was April 1st of 2021, when you stopped retail sale, you can type in April 1st of 2021 right into that box, or you can select the little calendar button and you'll see a calendar appear and be able to select the uh, day that that retail sale was actually stopped. Additional questions below, not required, but helpful information for the fast track team and compliance is have you stopped production of the product and have you stopped distribution of the product and again depending on how you answer these questions if you say yes you're going to get a date box that pops up beneath if you say no nothing will populate below so you won't see that date box we also ask about the notification measures that you've taken so once you select yes that you've stopped sale of the product notification measures taken populates and this is a required field we ask, have you notified consumers? Have you notified the distribution chain? Have you notified others? And if so, provide additional information. And for purposes of this demo, we've assumed that you've notified consumers and you've notified others. That other free text box will allow you to provide more color to the CPSC about who else you've notified in your chain of commerce. So, uh, you can see, just as Phil was showing you, on the left-hand side, the menu shows, hey, we've completed the stop sales section. It's got a green check mark, and now we've moved on to product distribution uh, that has a yellow dot. So the first question on product distribution is the total number of products distributed in the U.S., we, which is a required field. And then we ask you to break that number down in terms of where in the chain of commerce the products actually are. How many are with manufacturers? How many are with distributors? How many are with retailers? And how many are with consumers? This is very similar to the existing reporting system. Uh, it's just organized in a bit of a different way on product distribution. We also ask, and these are required questions because they impact the press release document that this system is generating for you based on templates. Was the product distributed in Canada? And you have a yes or no option there. And was it distributed 
in Mexico. And again, you have a yes or no option there. And for purposes of the demonstration, we have presumed that it was the product was distributed in Canada and it was distributed in Mexico. You'll see that just like in prior screens, an additional question populates right beneath, asking for the total number of products distributed in Canada, the total number distributed in Mexico. And if you don't know, we've given you the option to check the unknown at this time box. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see the brand name, model name, and number. Uh, appears, this will pre-populate from what you entered in the initial report because you should be thinking about the initial report that Phil walked you through and this additional information on a fast track case as bookends. So you've submitted an initial report. That's the only way that you've hit these additional information screens. So your brand name and model name number supplied at the initial report stage will pre-populate here. I mentioned when we were going through the checklist, if you realize between submitting an initial report and this additional information that other brand names, model names, or numbers are involved. You have the ability to hit the plus sign on the left-hand side and add additional brand names and model numbers. You'll also have the ability to delete ones that are erroneous. You also can supply serial numbers, date codes, and UPC codes, although you'll see that that information, while very helpful to consumers, uh, is not a mandatory field because it doesn't have the red asterisk. So on this screen, even though the menu bar across the left-hand side and the screen layout should look very familiar, it's actually something that's changed from the initial report. And this is the first screen where you see it. And it's that there's a save button at the bottom of the screen. So when Phil was taking you through the initial report, the system doesn't know who you are unless you've originated from the business portal and clicked the Section 15B report button to start uh, the initial report screens that Phil walked you through. So um, he talked about pre-populating information about your contact information for the firm that you work with. That all happens if you originate from the business portal. But let's assume you don't. How do you save your information? For an initial report, unfortunately, there's not a way to save that information. The good news is, is that you saw that's six very easy screens to complete. So, you know, there, your completion time there, once you've gathered all the information that you need, should be very quick. The additional information section that I'm walking you through is a much more robust uh, questionnaire, we'll say. You're providing a lot more detailed information, and we recognize that, that you may start down this path on completing additional information, yet not have all the info that you need to complete it, which is why we have a save button. So if you're starting from the business portal and you click save, this draft additional information report is gonna save in your business portal account. And I'll talk more about what that means uh, at the end of showing you all these slides. If you don't have a business portal account and you click save, the good news is, is you're gonna get an email that will include a hyperlink for you to follow, a verification code um, to enter to confirm your identity. And you'll be able to pick up where you left off in this system at a future date once you have all the information that you need. So we talked about product distribution. Product details really also relates to distribution, but it's just more in-depth information on the product itself and how it made its way into commerce. So we also ask about distribution of the product. Was it nationwide in the US or was it limited or regionally distributed? And if it's limited or regional, we're gonna ask you to specify where. We ask when the product was sold. And again, this is a required field. We're looking for a start date and an end date uh, on the product sale dates, the production importation dates. We also need a date began and ended, again, a required field there. And then the distribution dates themselves, the date that that began and the date that it ended are also required there. For retail price, this is a required field. Why? Because it goes in a press release. Each of these required things are going to be needed to finish the case, uh, hence the red asterisk. So retail price is set up um, to accept amounts in US dollars, you can include a range or you know you can include one price. If the item was only sold for $100, you'd put $100 in there. But you could also put a range, $100 to $150, depending on where it was purchased. At the bottom, you'll see where and how was the product sold is another required field. And what we're looking for here is more color on how the product is being distributed. Was it sold in brick and mortar and online? Uh, you know, was it sold in traditional retail? If so, where? 
Uh, and as Phil mentioned, you've got a pretty big text box there to supply information to us. You're looking at about 10 lines of text. And because this is gonna work on a tablet, it's gonna work on a phone uh, in, in the same way that it works on a desktop computer or a laptop computer. We think that's gonna make it much more user-friendly for you to supply each of these pieces of information to us that are critical for processing the case efficiently. So we've completed now three of the nine steps. We move to hazard information. So hazard description, we're looking for more detail than was supplied at the initial report stage that Phil walked you through. And again, there's a question mark next to the required hazard description field. And that question mark's a hover over and will cue you, please describe the possible mechanism of injury for the product you're reporting. So is there a, an, is there an electrocution risk when certain things happen? Is there a fire danger when certain things happen? You would provide more information in that free text box there. The primary hazard that was supplied at the initial report stage, it's a drop down. That information should pre-populate from your initial report because again, your initial report and your additional information submissions are bookends in your fast track case. Just as it wasn't a mandatory field at the initial reporting stage, secondary hazard will also have drop downs. And the fields in these drop downs were keeping exactly what is shown on the existing site. So, for those of you that are very familiar with the online Section 15B system right now, you're going to see the same choices in primary hazard and secondary hazard. We also require you to submit when the hazard was discovered. And again, we're looking for a date here. You have the ability to select from a calendar or you can type in a specific date. How was the hazard discovered? And again, this is a free text box where you can let us know, you know, it was reported by a consumer, um, internal testing revealed this hazard, what have you. But we're looking for more information on how the hazard was discovered by your firm. Now across what is basically the center of your screen, I guess it's probably the lower, uh, two thirds of your screen is a question in blue. Have there been injuries or deaths since submitting your initial report to the US Consumer Product Safety Commission? And that's a yes or a no question. The reason that question is here is we understand that there could be folks that start the initial report and they have everything they need. They wanna proceed fast track. All the documents that they need to submit to us are ready to go. They complete the initial report screens, those quick six screens that Phil went through, and then they get to this section and they complete this section very quickly and that submission happens the same day. So your initial report filing date and your additional information filing date for your fast track case have the same date stamp. Those people we are very grateful for, but we also realize that there could be circumstances where a firm meets their section 15 filing obligation by submitting their initial report information, but they don't have more information when they make that initial report. They wanna go fast track, but they just don't have enough info to fill out all of these screens that I'm walking through. When that is the case, we realize that there could be a period of time, it could be a week or more of lag where an injury or a death could take place based on the hazard. And so we're trying to capture that here. So depending on what you select, if you select yes, you'll get a free text box that will appear and say provide details on subsequent injuries or death. If you select no, that free text box will not appear and you'll just see the question below, which is are there any component parts that are involved in this hazard? If you select yes, we require you to supply us the component supplier name and the component part product. And again, only component parts that are involved in the hazard, not every component part associated with the product. Now we move to remedy. First question here is what is the proposed remedy? Refund, repair, or replacement? And depending on what you select for your proposed remedy, you're going to get text that's going to cue you as to what will be required of you based on the selection. So if you select repair, you're going to get a pop-up that says you must provide consumer instructions and technical documents supporting the proposed repair. 
you will be able to submit these documents in the upcoming attachments section. And you can see on the left-hand menu that we're making our way, albeit probably slower than you would like, because I want to go in depth on each of these screens, but you see that attachments is the last screen. Uh, so you'll be able to submit those consumer instructions and the technical documents during the attachments page. And I'll walk through uh, how that's going to work in just a second. If you select replacement, we're going to be looking for technical documents supporting the proposed replacement, and this pop-up is going to cue you to that. You're going to have to get those documents ready because we're going to expect you to attach them in the attachment section that's coming up. If you select repair and replacement, we're going to be looking for consumer instructions and technical documents that support your repair and your replacement. And again, you'll submit those uh, at the attachment screen. If you select refund, I should say you're not going to get any pop-up but repair and replacement, depending on whether you select one or both, will cue that pop-up language. When will your remedy be available? And again, we're looking for a calendar date here. Depending on what you complete in this field, uh, you may see a pop-up that gives you the following warning. If your proposed repair or replacement will not be available for an extended period of time, you may not be eligible for the Fast Track program. Now, Regardless of that date that you put in on when available, you are going to be able to continue to advance to the next screen by hitting next. And it will show that you've completed your remedy section here as long as you've completed all the required fields with the red asterisk that appear on the screen. So this is distinct from the stop sale where if you say no, I have not stopped sale, you will not be able to proceed. But this is meant to be a warning that you know if you're talking about months in the future, uh, for a proposed remedy and you don't have uh, an alternative that's available sooner, you may not be eligible to be in the Fast Track program. For your proposed remedy, we are looking for a little bit more details there. And again, that goes in the press release. That goes into what ultimately gets released to the public uh, if a repair or a replacement is involved. So we're looking for more details on how that will work. If it's a repair, maybe consumers need to bring the product to a certain location or a certain chain of locations uh, within a certain time frame. All of that information can be supplied in that free text box that's set up to receive uh, 20, about 20 lines of free text. Next, we'll look for information on the recall notice that you plan to provide. And the first question that appears on the screen is, do you have the ability to contact at least 95% of the product's consumers? And this is a required field you can select yes or no. Regardless of whether you select yes or no, there will be a free text box below that asks for you to explain how you would accomplish direct notice to consumers. We left that free text box there uh, because if you have 95% of products consumers, it's going to impact the press release template that's going to populate. You'll be eligible for a recall, alert, a recall alert template, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But if you don't have 95% of the products consumers, you information, contact information, you may have 75% of the product's consumer's information, and you can let us know that in this free text box. And it may end up impacting how your case is handled by the Fast Track team and compliance. The next section is asking for the proposed web addresses where you plan to post the recall. You can type in um, you know, www locations here and they can stack on top of one another. It's a free text box, so it's meant to accept really um, any text and symbols, you can separate them with a semicolon, you can stack them on top of one another, however you want to supply that information. And then lastly, because we are in the age of social media, which social media platforms does your company use? This is a required field and we're asking you to select all that apply. As you select uh, each of those, you're going to get a drop down. The options that you're going to have appear there. If there is a social media platform that you use, you know, TikTok is not listed. If you use TikTok and that's a great way for you to communicate with your consumers, then you can click other and you'll have the ability to put in information about that additional social media platform. But we've also, uh, I should mention, it's not shown on this uh, display, but each time you select a social media platform, you're going to supply the handle um, or your account information for that uh, social media platform, not the login information, but just uh, what your YouTube handle is or your Twitter handle. And then lastly, this is going to look just like 
what Phil showed you for the initial report. We need the contact information of the individual that's supplying this additional information. And again, if you've originated from the business portal, you can easily select the individual making the report as the manufacturer, importer, or retailer, and it will populate your firm's information straight from the business portal and give you a cleaner screen. If you are a, um, a consultant or a private attorney, not an in-house attorney, but a private attorney that's working for a client and submitting this information online on their behalf, this is where you would complete your law firm information. And just as Phil mentioned, uh, and as I just noted, if you select the individual making the report as the manufacturer, importer, or retailer, it's gonna pre-populate all that mailing address information. You don't have to type any of that out. You'll just supply your first name, your last name, an email address, and your title. Two things to point out on this page, and it's the same for this additional information section as it is for the initial report. Why is the email address important? Phil talked about notifications that will come to you when you submit uh, either an initial report and or additional information via this system or submit attachments via this system. The email address that's tied to those notifications is the one that you provide on this screen at the end of the initial report and at the end of the additional information section. So you wanna make sure that the person who's responsible for managing the Section 15B case with compliance, with you know, fast track, a regulated case, uh, a non-fast track compliance enforcement and litigation case, that their email address is there because that's who is going to be receiving the automated notifications that a filing has happened, the PDFs that are available for download, uh, and reminders that something is due to the CPSC on an open case. Uh, we ask for the contact person title. Why do we do that? Because uh, documentation that comes from the CPSC to the individual filing the report, we want to be able to address you appropriately. So we ask for your title there, but it is not a required field. All right, this is one of the big changes. In addition to making this system uh, cleaner, more user-friendly, working on a tablet, having bells and whistles like email notifications and confirmations when you submit things, that's all fine and good. But we really thought adding this press release template would be a huge benefit. So when you get to this screen and you're completing additional information for the Fast Track program, you're not gonna see what we're looking at on our screen. Uh, this is just for demo purposes. What you're gonna see is a text editor that has a fixed press release template in it with information pre-populated based on your submission at the initial report stage and the submissions that you've made on prior pages for this additional information section. And the four press release templates that could populate are a recall alert template, which would populate when a firm selects that they have 95% of the consumer contact information. If the product has been distributed in Canada, the press release template will populate with information about a recall with Health Canada. If the product has been distributed in Mexico, the press release template will populate with information about a recall in conjunction with Profeco and the CPSC. And then finally, if you don't meet the requirements on having 95% of your customer's contact info, the product wasn't distributed in Canada, it wasn't distributed in Mexico, then the standard fast track recall press release template is what's going to populate. But again, on this screen, when the system launches, you will not see this bulleted list here. You'll see a text editor um, that I think we're mostly familiar with using in other government systems that's gonna have a lot of the language fixed and those are press release terms that must be in there. But editable text will be there uh, with your pre-populated information from subsequent screen submissions. All right, lastly, we've got this attachments page. Now, a few things to remember here. This page is really, and you know, I realized we had to generate these system mockups in PowerPoint, uh, which means that you know, they're gonna display a little less aesthetically pleasing than they will when the actual system launches and you're using it on your computer. But you should note, that uh, the great news is on the left-hand side for our menu, we've completed eight of the nine steps. We're on the last page here. The attachment screen is broken into two parts and it's really customized based on the way that you've answered 
questions in your initial report and this additional information pages that we've just gone through. Everybody is going to have in their required section product photos. You see there's a required attachment section and an optional attachment section. Everybody's going to have product photos. If for your remedy you select repair or replacement, we are going to require technical documents submissions from you. You'll be able to click the upload button and submit those documents then. If you've selected repair as your remedy, we're going to ask for repair instructions that would go to a consumer letting them know about how to effectuate that repair or that repair. Uh, you can upload those repair instructions by clicking the upload button. If you've confirmed that there were injuries or deaths associated with the product, that's either at the initial report stage or at the additional information stage, meaning that injuries or deaths in total is greater than zero, we're going to require you to submit injury or death report information right now. And you would do that by clicking the upload button. And then lastly, um, testing reports to a safety standard. If you selected the box that says you are reporting a potential violation of a mandatory safety standard because you're a regulated product, such as a mattress or children's sleepwear, um, in that case, you would have selected, you know, there's a potential for a violation of a mandatory safety standard. If in the case of a mattress, it's highly flammable, there's a flammability standard on mattresses, same goes for children's sleepwear, a flammability standard. If you're in potential violation of the flammability standards there, and you selected a potential violation of a mandatory safety standard, you have to supply testing reports to the safety standard. And we would ask that you upload those by clicking the upload button. Now again, anything that populates in the required attachment section, you will need to upload a document in order to proceed to the next page. If you don't have the documents, you can always select save. And as I mentioned, if you have a business portal account, the um, saved link to this partially completed additional information report will be there. You can log into your business account, follow the link, it'll take you right back to this screen. You upload the additional documents you need, you hit next and submit and you're good. Uh, if you don't have a business portal account, clicking save will mean that you get an email to an email address where you verify your identity, you follow that link and it'll take you back to this page and you can complete the report at a later date. So. The required attachment section, again, just to stress, A through E are appearing here because we've assumed for purposes of this demonstration that you have selected repair and replacement as your remedy, that injuries or deaths are over zero, and there's a potential violation of a mandatory safety standard. If any of those things do not apply, then those items would fall off of the required attachment section and become optional attachments. And look, when we were setting up this attachments page, we wanted to make it cleaner. The existing way that you attach documents in the online system is just attaching one document that has everything submitted as a PDF or just randomly attaching documents. Uh, and we wanted it to be more organized and we wanted to cue you truly to the information that we're gonna need on, within our agency to process your case more expeditiously. So for optional attachments, again, these are not required submissions, but you have the ability to submit them. And if you have this information, we would appreciate if you did. Further description of complaints or injury, we would like to hear uh, more information there. That could uh, be picking up subsequent injuries or deaths associated, associated with the product since filing the initial report. Maybe you want to parse that out there. Uh, it could be a catch-all for a lot of things related to complaints and injuries. The stop sale notice or letter to distribution chain, retailers or consumers, we would love to see either a proposed or an executed stop sale notice that you've issued. And you can upload it there by clicking the upload button. A website mock-up of your recall notice, again, proposed or executed there would be great for us to see. Social media posts, same with proposed or executed, you can upload those. And then you also have the ability to upload 10, up to 10 additional documents. And when you click upload, the document name will populate just as here we've titled it document ABC and attached a PDF, but you'll also get a free text box that will allow you to describe what that attachment is. And that's some functionality that does not exist in the current system. So just like Phil showed you, uh, there is a review and submission screen. I will say here, because I realize the text is tiny, a few things to note. 
PowerPoint is not a website, right? It is set up on a horizontal viewer. So uh, when it comes time to review and submit your additional information to the CPSC, you're not going to see uh, columns of information stacked horizon horizontally next to one another. That's just done to let you know, you know, there's different sections and they'll all appear on the screen. Uh, you would actually scroll and that would work on a tablet, it would work on a phone, again, a desktop and a laptop computer, of course it's gonna work there. Uh, but this will easily work on mobile devices too. If you wanted to edit any of the information, this is meant to just be a, a pretend summary here on each of the fields that we've completed. You could click the edit button and it would take you back to that section. So if you clicked edit on product information, it would take you uh, back to the distribution and details section and you'd be able to edit. As Phil mentioned, if you don't wanna click the edit buttons in each of the little shown sections and review and submission, you can click the menu bar on the left-hand side and it'll take you right back to that page and you just click next, next, next to get back to this end review and submission page. So just like at the initial report stage, you're going to be asked via checkbox to attest that the information that you're submitting is truthful and accurate to the best of your knowledge as of the time of submission. And your options here are to go back to prior screens, to save where you are and not yet submit, or to submit an additional uh, information report. So if you click submit, You'll see the exact same page that Phil showed you at the end of the initial report submission, and you're gonna get a few options here. You're gonna see your report number. You're gonna see the date that it was submitted. You'll have the ability to download a PDF copy of your additional report that's just been submitted to the CPSC. Also, as I mentioned, the email address for the person filing the report is gonna get an email confirmation that says, thank you for submitting your additional report to the CPSC. If you have subsequent attachments to submit, follow this link to submit additional attachments, and it will have a copy of the report also PDF'd on that auto-generated email to the email address supplied for the person supplying the, or providing the report. Uh, as Phil mentioned, the same thing will appear on the bottom if you don't have a business portal account with us. We'll give you the option to register, and you can you know, download your additional report submission for the Fast Track program and register uh, for a business portal account both right from this screen. So in summary, the goals of this project really are trying to standardize the starting point for all fast track cases. When we looked at the data, what we saw was that Section 15 reports were coming in every which way. And uh, admittedly, the, the process itself for submitting uh, you know, there are so many options, it's like a veritable potpourri. You could use the online system. When we went through the online system, there's not a break on initial report and what's traditionally been called a full report, like we've broken this system into. In order to submit with the existing online system, you've got to supply all the information that Phil and I have just gone through at one time to even click the submit button and have the system take your submission. So we thought that that was kind of onerous for folks that were just at the very early stages and really didn't have full report level information and just wanted to meet an initial reporting obligation under section 15 because it was very early and being notified of a potential issue. So we thought to standardize the starting point for all fast track cases that we would make the online system very easy to use in hopes of, and as Phil mentioned, transitioning in phases to using the online system to submit your initial report and additional information, a requirement for fast track cases going forward. We also wanted to minimize requests for more information after submission. Phil didn't mention this, but you know, this is a topic area that we have um, discussed at ICFASO in 2020, in February of 2020 before uh, the world shut down and we actually met in person. Uh, and the online uh, ICFASO annual symposium that happened in 2021. In both cases, we've talked about wanting to redo this fast track system, and we've gotten feedback. Thank you so much to everybody who was part of submitting feedback to us through uh, our presentation at ICFASO and supplying our email addresses at those events, or even touching base with us after the fact to provide information on how to make it easier to uh, submit online section for Section 15. That has been a huge help. But one of the things that we really heard over and over is 
you know, I, I try to use the online system. I go through, I submit everything uh, that it seems that the system wants me to submit and you guys still come back and you ask me for more information. And I spent so much time doing the online submission. I, you know, I, I can't win. So by streamlining the online system and truly, I mean, we have spent months going through line by line what we're asking for, deciding what is required, like what is truly needed from a press release standpoint, uh, from a hazard identification standpoint, uh, from a corrective action plan standpoint, um, at the Office of Compliance, so that we're asking you for exactly what we need and we're cueing you to what we're looking for in terms of how that information is submitted. So, because we do wanna minimize the request for more information after you've submitted your initial report and additional information for fast track cases. We also wanted to streamline the press release process. This was feedback that we received from everybody. Uh, and we've tried to do that by making uh, the press release template auto-populate giving you the ability to edit the auto-populated information that's going to be supplied based on your inputs as you move through each of these screens. Um, but it'll give you an idea of what is coming in terms of press release um, from the CPSC and give you an opportunity uh, to have some say in the text that is appearing in that press release document. And again, it's customized based on your inputs. So, um, we thought that that would go a long way to making the process more streamlined. And then as Phil has mentioned, and I have mentioned, uh, business portal users, there's a lot of business portal users that already use that system for in-depth investigations and reviewing those or IDIs, and also for section six consumer complaints on potential, on, uh, potential product hazards. Business portal users are gonna have added functionality. They're gonna have an extra tab that has all their Section 15B reports, like a chronology of them appearing there. Uh, it'll give you the ability to go back to a saved additional information submission and you know, break up the submission time so that you can gather documents to actually give us what it is that we need in order to process the fast track case. Uh, and again, those email notifications, you're gonna receive uh, notice if um, your when a compliance case opens, your compliance officer information, the case number, uh, all of those things are going to go to a business portal user automatically, um, and they'll be um, it'll be kind of a one-stop place to go and see the status of all of your open Section 15 reports. And again, as I mentioned, online reporting through Section 15B system is going to be phased in, this is the vision now, as a requirement to enter the Fast Track Recall Program. And again, um, this is because we are trying truly to make this an efficient process from start to finish. So I know a question that people are gonna have is what is the potential timeline? We have heard from the folks that are helping us to build this system and they are in attendance today. So they're um, watching this presentation and they're um, going to be receiving the feedback from you guys and the questions that you ask. We've heard that we, we could have a system and we should have a system that is available for beta testing in uh, July or August of this year. So um, I'll talk about our call for beta testers uh, to give us some feedback from today's public hearing in just a second. Uh, and then, or I, I guess I should say our public meeting. Um, and then in terms of timeline for when the system will launch, the anticipated release date for this new system is gonna be late 2021. So uh, with all that being said, um, I two points. We would love to get feedback from you before we go to the audience Q&A. We would love to receive feedback from you. You have the ability to submit questions today through the questions section. You have the ability to email myself or Phil feedback that you have based on what you've seen today. We would love to get that feedback. We have tried to think of everything, but we realize you guys are, are who the, <laughs> The system is being built for, so you are going to know much better than us uh, about potential pitfalls. So you can email Phil or you can email myself or both of us at the email addresses on your screen. And I mentioned that we'll have a beta testing system available in July to August of this year. And we're doing a call for people that might be interested in serving as beta testers for us. If you are interested, you can scan the QR code that appears on your screen and provide your contact information to us. Again, timeframe here, we're looking at July to August of 2021. And um, 
we just would really appreciate uh, additional feedback from beta testers. You'll be able to move through the system uh, and provide, we're still working out the details on um, providing you know, dummy data to us uh, and just seeing how uh, the different rules that we're gonna put in place on each of the screens function and how the system will work. So uh, with that, I will open it up to uh, questions and uh, I will call uh, and see, or I'll, I'll ask Phil if um, he wants to take the first question. Thank you so much, Shelby. Yes, so the first question, um, for future fast track cases, will this be the only way to submit under section 15B and have a fast track case opened? So yes, this will be phased in as a requirement for fast track cases, utilizing this online form. For non-fast track cases, the online submission will be the preference, but will not be the only way to submit. But for fast track, it will be phased in as a requirement. Uh, and then Phil, I'll take the next question if that's all right. This is a super easy question. Is the webinar being recorded to share with those registered after? Uh, so thank you for that question. I probably should have said that. A good uh, webinar host would have provided that information at the get-go, so apologies there. Uh, yes, it is being recorded, and everybody who registered for this webinar is going to receive a, an email thanking you for attending within the next few business days, and in that email, Will be a link to view the video here. Uh, I believe you can share that video by forwarding that email to others, but that link may be unique to you. If so, um, and you want to share the recorded video with other folks to get their feedback, uh, the good news is, is um, we have a great team in communications that I work with frequently to put things on our YouTube channel. So this video will also eventually be posted to the business education playlist on the CPSC YouTube channel. Phil, I have I see one more question that's like a quick question. Do you mind if I uh, take that one? Go ahead. Okay. Um, please confirm that a lawyer submitting a fast track report for a firm need not register, and I think it cuts off, but I think this is gonna say for a business portal account, um, and I, I will confirm that. A lawyer that's submitting a fast track report, so you're submitting an initial report and additional information, all the screens Phil showed you, all the screens I showed you, uh, need not register for a business portal account. You're gonna get um, the screen that, that asks you to submit the individual filing the report, information, you'll supply your email address, your firm's contact info there, your title, uh, and you'll get the notifications via that email. Because again, uh, as I mentioned, the individual filing the report email address that you supply is really who's going to get the notifications. So you won't see the benefits of, um, you know, having your Section 15 reports queue up just like IDIs and Section 6 reports um, for Business Portal users. But from a functionality standpoint, you're still going to be able to save. Auto notices are still going to go to you. The confirmation that you filed online and the PDFs are still going to go to you as well. I will take the next question, Shelby. Um, someone wanted to know, how will the system pre-populate information? Um, so as, as we stated, it will pull it straight from the business portal. So for this feature to work, you must be logged into a business portal account and click to start a report. If you don't have a business portal account, then this feature will not function. Got it. All right. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, we've got a question. Will we be able to submit an initial report and additional information at the same time? The answer there is yes, we would love if people did that. If uh, you went online and said, I've got everything, I'm ready to go, you go through all the initial report screens that Phil went through, uh, and you go through all the additional information screens, you attach all the required attachments, you review that press release template, and you're good to go, you submit, and you can have the exact same filing date for your initial report and additional information, 
and that's going to send that info info right to Phil's team and fast track and you're uh, good to go. So I uh, love that question. For folks that can't submit uh, at the same time, you know, I mentioned we recognize that the additional information that we're asking for is kind of in depth, right? I mean, you may not have everything there uh, at the get-go. So if you don't, you have the ability to save and come back and uh, that's absolutely fine too. Shelby, I can take the next question. Um, uh, someone wanted to know what notifications will online submitters receive? Um, so those are those auto-generated notifications um, to the email address provided. So the types of things, again, that we'll provide is going to be a confirmation email upon submission of the initial report or the additional information. Um, it's going to be the attachments with downloadable PDFs. You're going to be notified when a case is opened and a case number is assigned and when a compliance officer is assigned. There's going to be email reminders to submit additional information if you chose fast track and any responses from the CPSC for additional information will also come this way. If any of your information on your case is updated, for instance, if the compliance officer changes, then you'll also receive an email notification as well. All right, uh, Phil, I'm going to take the next question. Uh, and it's, um, man, these are good questions. Okay, if you submit an initial report and you select fast track, how long do you have to complete the fast track information? Can you save the fast track info and come back later to finish filling it out? Um, so, great question. One of the things that we're trying to do with the new system is to set I, you know, I mentioned guardrails, but it's really safety rails in place, you know, akin to going bowling. Oh my gosh, when we could go bowling, when you could go bowling and they put those, you know, foam bumpers uh, in the gutter so that you don't roll gutter balls, we're going to try to put those foam bumpers up for you. And we're going to have the system build in uh, reminders to you via email. Hey, you've submitted an initial report, but not additional information. You selected fast track. You need to submit additional information in the next X number of days, and your notification will tell you that. Uh, and you'll get a few of those before you get a notification that says, hey, here's Phil's contact information. <laughs> you want to be in fast track, but we don't have what we need from you to open your case. Um, but great question. You're going to get the notifications. You're going to have um, you know, uh, a set amount of time. We haven't firmly set that amount of time, but you will get uh, I think it's three email reminders, and Phil, you can keep me honest here. I think it's three email reminders, and the last one includes Phil's contact information. Because I mean, truly, uh, once you get that third reminder, you know, we're talking, um, you know, I don't, we haven't set the times, but you know, more than a week or two has elapsed, and Fast Track can't open a case because they don't have what they need from you. So, um, yes, you can save your work and uh, you can't come back at a later date and you're going to get cues that the system is waiting for you to do that and Phil's team is waiting for you to do that. I will take the next question, Shelby. Um, will this online system only be available for fast track case reports? Um, so that answer is no. However, the focus of today's presentation is submission to the Fast Track Recall Program, um, but the updated system will be available and preferred for submitting Section 15B reports for non-Fast Track and regulated cases. However, for Fast Track submissions using the online system will be phased in as a requirement in the future. And uh, I will take the next question. Can you revise information such as product distribution if you become aware of new information? Great question. Um, the answer on the initial report is no. That's gonna be frozen in time. The initial report is meant to meet a statutory obligation for you to report within a very short window of time to us, and that is a report that cannot be edited. For additional information, yes. So if you're a fast track case and you've submitted your additional information, you can absolutely go in and edit your additional information report and I you know the 
uh, folks that are building this system are going to keep me honest here uh, because they are attending and they're listening and I'm hopeful, hoping I'm going to give the right information. Um, this is also a cue for me to say all the more reason for people to scan the QR code and be willing to give us more feedback via a beta test because that's going to be super helpful to us. Um, but the way it works for the additional information or the way it will work is that if you have a business portal account, you'll actually see both submissions. You'll see your original additional information submission and then your updated additional information submission and it's gonna have a new uh, filing date associated with it. So uh, great question. The answer there is yes. If you're not a business portal user, you're just gonna have emails in your email box that are confirming that additional information, the subsequent additional information submission. But on the initial report, the answer is no. Um, that's a fixed filing to meet a statutory obligation and there's not an edit function available there. I can take the next question, Shelby. Um, the user says, there is a quest this is a question in the additional information regarding who we have notified such as consumers or the distribution chain. Does that mean we are waiting for CPSC to approve our consumer notifications and remedy before we are filling out the additional information section? Um, no, so when filling out the additional information section, we want firms and users to provide us with the information um, to give us the entire background of what has happened so far so we can understand the entire situation. If you have sent out a notification to consumers, we ask that you upload that. If you have sent out notice to your distribution chain, we ask that you upload that. Now, if the recall proceeds in the manner in which um, you had explained to your consumers, then those letters wouldn't need to be updated. However, they're important to have in the case file. However, if you told consumers that you were going to provide them with a repair and in subsequent weeks, your company determined that a repair is really not possible and that a refund would have to be issued, then obviously those documents would have to be edited um, and reviewed by CPSC and resent out. All right, I, I will take the next question. Um, what if later I want to submit more attachments? Will I be able to do that after a submission? Um, so when Phil went through the initial report section, again, today we're focused on fast track. So we showed what the screens will look like after fast track. That is really a fork in the road on, do you want to go fast track, yes or no? If you say no, I don't want to go fast track, uh, you don't have an obligation to submit uh, all the additional information info to us we would love if you did but that's not going to hold up your case being opened at the cpsc um, but I, I guess the the thing i want to stress here is if you don't select fast track meaning non-fast track case at the initial report stage you have two opportunities to provide more info to us before hitting submit on that initial report one is additional comments and Phil showed you, you know, it's a large text box where you can type in free text. And then the second thing is attachments. You can supply attachments to the CPSC at the initial report stage. So you can do it then. Um, for additional information, folks proceeding fast track, you've got to complete that additional information. So there's a giant attachments page to submit stuff. But what if you forgot something, right? And you want to attach more information. For business portal users, very easy click on your section 15b case file you open it back up you go to the attachments page you add an other attachment or one of the optional documents on that page hit upload hit submit you're good to go there's a record for non and and that will appear in your business portal account for non-business portal users you're going to be relying on the email system so when you submit additional information you're gonna get that confirmation email that says thank you for submitting your additional information report to the CPSC. Here's the report via PDF. If you would like to submit additional attachments, follow this link and it will take you right back to the attachments phase. So, you, or, sorry, the attachments page. So the interface is going to look exactly the same that it does, uh, that I just showed you for the additional information section. Great question. 
and something that we we kind of anticipated um, is going to happen throughout the process. Thank you, Shelby. I will take the next one. Someone asked, is the ability to contact 95% of the products uh, of the product consumers a requirement to proceed in fast track? No, absolutely not. What the distinction is with being able to contact 95% or more consumers is the difference between a recall alert and a press release. Going the recall alert route being able to contact consumers about their consumer products, we we know historically is the most efficient way to get the message out. Direct contact of consumers. If you cannot contact 95% of consumers, then the other route is a press release. And what that press release will do is we require, we require all forms of social media to be used by the firm. That report will go up on our website, will go up on the firm's website, and it will go out to the media outlets as well. All right, Phil, I'll take the next question. I don't know how well I'm gonna do answering it, if I'm being honest. All right, um, if, but it's a great question. And this is why you know we were so excited to do this webinar, is we knew that we were gonna get questions from the actual users of this system, and it's why we're excited about doing a beta test uh, you know, later in the summer. So here's the question. If we have a product which is distributed in Canada, but have a separate organization or subsidiary which handles Health Canada recalls, how would this be handled when selecting the templates? Great question. So a few things come to mind here. Um, you have free text space near the was the product distributed in Canada or Mexico um, you could enter that information in the free text space um, it could you know I don't know and Phil knows way better than me if it would impact the actual content of the press release form itself or if it's just a way of um, distributing that information and who's responsible for distributing that information on your end um, so a free text box comes to mind as an option. You also have the opportunity. Oh, I think Phil's got ideas. Yeah, you jump in. You probably know this better than me. Yeah. So the information regarding the the units outside the U.S. with either Mexico or Canada, the amount of information that goes on our press releases is is limited. It's the number of units, um, and then we also provide a link to the release. So it's not a ton of substantial information that we're requiring. So if there was another person who was in your company or firm that was dealing with Health Canada, it would be um, quite easy to get that information from them um, and then you'd be able to relay that to us. Um, so I don't see that as being a giant hurdle, but I understand that with large companies, um, globally distributing products, there are gonna be unique situation. So like Shelby said, that text box is the best place to provide us with that background information. The other thing that I would add is you also have the ability on the recall notices page. In addition to picking the social media platforms that you would use, you can put the websites uh, where it would post. So if your subsidiary is going to be posting that recall notice, then uh, that could go in that um, the section on um, web addresses where the recall notice posting is going to go, but uh, great question there. Man, this is like an embarrassment of riches, Phil. <laughs> you, you guys have no idea, but we're looking at a very long scrollable list of questions that you've all submitted as we've been talking here. Um, so Phil, do you want to take the next question or you want me to take one? I can take the next one. Um, so someone has asked, what are some reasons for not doing a fast track recall? Um, this is a great question. Um, so the benefit of the fast track program is that a the commission does not make a substantial product hazard determination on your on the product. So in doing in, in choosing to go the fast track recall route, your company or firm is entering into a voluntary recall with CPSC. If your firm or company wants to recall the product, then that is your best route. If your firm acknowledges that they are reporting to us 
incidents or injuries um, that have occurred, but do not feel that the product um, is an SPH and does not want to move forward with a recall, then that company would choose to go non-fast track. All right, I'll take the next question. Um, and this is, I mean, again, I can't say enough. Thank you guys for these questions because this is helping us build a better system uh, that functions for you guys better. Can there be more than one contact person? Can only one person work on an initial or additional info screens? Um, so the way that the system is set up is there is one individual that's making the report. If I am reading this question correctly, um, this may be somebody asking, can more than one person submit a report? Meaning two contacts submit a report. Um, as it is currently designed, that answer is no, but we would love for you to be a beta tester for us and actually um, <laughs> let us know if that functionality would help. Um, from a functionality standpoint, because we've broken the screens in um, from the existing online system, you know, it's all one, right now it's the initial report and it's everything from additional information and more stuff that we um, decided the reg didn't require and we didn't need to process the case so we've kind of streamlined that down but we've broken it into two parts initial report and additional information um, two people could conceivably submit an additional report or initial report that could have person a's email address and additional information could have person B's email address because you are manually entering at the end of both sections contact information for the person submitting the report. Um, but if this question is, can you make it so that more than one person can submit a report simultaneously as it's currently designed? No, but we will talk to the team that's designing it about how that functionality might be able to be enabled. Shelby, I will take the next one. Someone asks, does this new system replace the written full report? And that answer is yes. For Fast Track, <clears throat> I went through the initial report section and then Shelby followed with that, what's called the additional information. All of that information in that additional information section um, replaces the previous written full report. All right, I'll take the next question. Uh, when will we be given the name and contact person at CPSC for our case? Um, so, great question. And it um, and in true lawyer fashion, I will answer with, well, it depends. Um, here's why it depends. If you are a non-fast track case, when you submit your initial report, if you don't have any more additional information to submit and you, you know, give us additional comments and maybe attach some attachments and you click submit, you've started a case in non-fast track. So either on the regulated side or the compliance enforcement and litigation side, you've started a case. You will get a confirmation email that when your case opens with the case number, the compliance officer assigned to that case, their contact information, um, so that'll happen at that point, at filing the initial report. That's for non-fast track. For fast track, you've got two steps you've got to complete. You've got to submit the initial report, and then you've got to complete that additional information that I just went through, including supplying attachments and reviewing that press release template. Once you've completed those two steps and submitted the additional information report, that's when you're going to get an email once the fast track case is opened that gives you the case number, this assigned compliance officer and their contact information. Great question. Shelby, I will take the next one. This is a question regarding our stop stopping sale and that, that being a requirement for Fast Track. Um, someone says, if your product issue is limited to a specific batch, is the expectation that all sales are stopped or just affected units? Um, the current wording looks like it implies to all sales. So again, depending on the situation, um, what we are most concerned with is stopping sale of the affected units. 
Now, let me give you a quick example. If it's a bike manufacturer and they make blue bikes and pink bikes and the pink bikes have a basket and the basket is detaching and catching in the wheel of the bike, causing a injury fall hazard. Then since the blue bike does not have a basket, then that hazard wouldn't be present on that. And stopping sale of that product would not be required. However, depending on the specific situation, we do wanna make sure that the scope is wide enough um, because there are unknowns. Sometimes it's clear, cut and dry and easy to see. However, um, if there are unknowns, it's always better to err on the side of caution. I will take the next question. Um, and it's that some folks are having problems scanning the QR code. So depending on the resolution of your screen, you are looking at a picture of my computer screen. So it could be that that QR code is a little blurry. I would recommend that you um, go to the handout that's available for download on the right-hand side. And at the end of that PDF handout is gonna be this last slide. That QR code will be clear and crisp because it's gonna be a PDF on your screen. Um, so I think that's the best way. But again, if you wanna be a beta tester, we would love you to give us subsequent feedback after this public meeting. So uh, please, you can email me, smathis at cpsc.gov, and um, I'll send you the link that that QR code is meant to take you to. Uh, apologies that, uh, you know, depending on the display uh, or the resolution on your screen that the QR code isn't uh, coming up. I know that's a bummer, and I'm sorry about that. I took an easy question. Sorry, Phil, but I, I realized there's no way for me to fix this. So I just wanted to let folks know that probably the handout would have a cleaner, uh, a better QR code to display. Not a problem. Um, I will take the next one. Someone says notifying retailers to stop sale to consumers can be a tantamount to announcing a recall. Are we now essentially notifying retailers of a recall before we can even file an initial report online? So part of the requirement of the fast track pro program is stopping sale of that product. Now, it, um, depending on the timing of this, um, informing your retailers that there's a potential product hazard is a good thing. And I, we understand that that is a, a uh, sometimes uh, takes a lot of time and effort to do so, an explanation on your part. However, it is critical and important to do so if you believe that your product could be potentially hazardous. Um, so I think my best answer would be doing them concurrently um, while filing the report. Um, and we've provided text boxes if your situation um, is not one way or the other, and then you can provide us with that information. I will take another um, systems <laughs> question. Uh, will emails be sent to all business users registered? Great question. So um, probably some uh, part of this whole process that Phil has not loved, but I have found really interesting is how granular we've had to get on uh, privileges within the business portal and who receives automatic notifications, who will see uh, the section 15 reports. So to your question, are emails gonna be sent to all the business users that are registered for an entity if someone from that entity with business portal privileges clicks the section 15 button and submits an initial report or additional information, is everybody who has an account gonna get a notification? No. The only person that's gonna get a notification is the individual making the report and fair point to the person who asked what if we want to add more than one person? Great point, and it's something we'll look into. But no, business users will not all get an email notification that a report has been submitted. Flip side of that is who is going to see Section 15 reports that have been made for an entity? And that is something that we've kind of parsed out with the team that is building the system. Uh, and it depends on the level of privileges that individuals have in the business portal. If they're a full uh, privileged admin user, meaning they see right now all the Section 6 consumer complaints, they see all the IDIs, they will in their Section 15 tab 
see all the reports that have been submitted. But again, it depends on their level of privilege on whether or not it would appear in their business portal account. That's probably more information than you wanted to know, but I thought it was a great question. And it really gets to the meat of how the email notifications will work and the benefits of using the business portal. Um, the next question is, what is the maximum time frame between the initial reporting and the additional information reporting? Um, so for Fast Track, the timing of cases um, will remain consistent. However, CPSC will have now, with the new system, a more clear idea and a more distinct date of when the initial report was submitted and the additional report, the additional information was submitted. And then the functionality that we've built in is reminders in between the initial report and the additional information. And those reminders will provide the submitter with an email saying, you provided the initial report on this day, we are still waiting on this information. And what those reminders do will keep the process moving. Um, the requirement of the fast track program is that a firm um, submits an initial report and additional information to CPSC and is ready to move forward with a voluntary recall and offer consumers an adequate remedy for the product. Um, and although there is no set time frame in number of days, we expect firms to come to the table with the information and proceed in a fashion where progress is being made and ultimately that both the CPSC and the reporting firm are working their hardest to get the recall out. Um, we have to take a step back and re remember that uh, the safety of consumers is at stake here. So it is important to keep the process moving um, and in instances where the process does not seem to be kept moving, um, then additional actions could be taken. And um, again, I'll stress, you're gonna get email notifications. Whoever submitted your initial report, but hasn't submitted the additional information that's needed for the fast track case to open, uh, that initial report submitter, the individual filing the report, that email address, is going to get, I think it's three email notifications in succession that says, basically, in a nice way, hey, the CPSC is still waiting on an additional information submission from you. And the last one will be a little firmer and it'll say, hey, here's Phil Burmell's contact information, the Fast Track Program Supervisor, in the nicest way, uh, and include a link to follow to submit your additional information at that time. So you will get noticed that you're running out of time <laughs> to do that. And as long as you respond to those email notifications, uh, they'll be able on the fast track side of things to hopefully start processing your information as long as you've supplied what they needed. Uh, and okay, Phil, I will take uh, another question. Will there still be a case officer assigned that I can talk to? Yes. So. Um, we probably have not done a great job of conveying this today. We are not trying to turn the compliance process into a series of automated robots that are processing your cases. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to give you an online system that will make it easier for you to meet your Section 15 reporting obligations to us, do it quickly, do it, do it in a fashion that we have all kind of become accustomed to. And I think you know the past year has really shown us that we can make leaps and bounds in terms of technology. Um, but you're still gonna have a case officer assigned to your case, just like you, you do in the current system. Um, the only caveat I will say is it depends on the case type as to when that compliance officer gets assigned because the case has to be opened for a compliance officer to be assigned. So for non-fast track cases at the initial report submission, that's when a, a compliance officer is going to be assigned and you're going to get that email notification, the individual filing, the report, that email address is going to get a notification that says, hey, here's your compliance officer. For fast track cases, the case will not be opened until the, in, the additional information is submitted. 
once that's submitted you'll get an email here's your case number here's your compliance officer here's the compliance officer's contact information so uh, not trying to turn everything into bots really trying to streamline the way that our agency is taking in information so ultimately we can help you get to a finish line faster and we can process uh, the cases and the information that we're getting in a really in a timely fashion All right, Phil, I've got another question that I just wanted to address. I think this is probably something that uh, folks may have in the back of their mind, and maybe we addressed it properly. I just wanted, I made a note to myself to touch base uh, or reconnect on this one. Can we change our mind on proceeding in fast track or non fast track? And how does the system handle that? Can I pose that question to you, Phil? Absolutely. Um, so for business portal users, you'll log into your account and change the selection on an existing case. For non-business portal users, you'll be able to follow a link in the confirmation email that you receive when you submit either the initial report or additional information. Awesome. And then I've got uh, another question here, and I'll take this one because uh, it has to do with um, down the road. What are we anticipating? Could you prepare a template, and I think this means a press release template, for us to download and to share a draft with our clients? So again, um, this is one of the benefits of beta testing, is we will have that editable, that text editor press release template set up. Uh, you will be able to move through the system and make different selections. So for a press release template, those selections, and you know, again, it's on the slides that are available for download as a handout, uh, are can you do direct notice to 95% of your consumers? Do you have their contact information? Depending on that answer, it will impact the press release template. Is the product distributed in Canada? Is it distributed in Mexico? The way those two questions are answered will impact the press release template. And uh, the fourth option is no direct notice, no Canada distribution, no Mexico distribution. Um, so there's really four options. And by moving through the beta testing system, you'll be able to see each of those press release templates, but we can actually look at um, making it a little easier for the beta testers to um, share the, the template that we're looking at for that text editor too. That's a great suggestion. Just to add on to that, just to remind everyone, um, the final press release and the information inside of it will not change. That will remain the same. Um, it's just what Shelby just explained is how we ultimately get to that information and how we ask for it is being done in a different way. But again, that final press release, um, release that gets released out, um, that will remain the same. All right, so I'll do one last call uh, for folks to submit any questions if they have additional questions that they would like for us to answer. I think, um, you know, we have gone through everything uh, that folks have submitted. Thank you to the folks that have submitted questions like there's a red asterisk on this field. Do you, you know, we don't understand the subsequent questions. We're gonna take those back with us and the design team for this system and take a hard look at uh, each of those comments. But you know, that's the benefit of this webinar. So one last call for questions. I do, I did make one more note for myself because you know, I'm a good, uh, <laughs> I try to be good at these housekeeping items for webinars. Uh, what does it mean to be a beta tester? Like, what are we expecting of a beta tester? So uh, it's not fully fleshed out yet because um, we're still waiting on the system to be completed that could be beta tested. But uh, we are anticipating that um, folks that volunteer to provide us some feedback as a beta tester would be able to page through this system interact with each of the fields. You would not be entering real live information. You could if you wanted, but know that we're not opening cases, uh, actual compliance cases for these things. Uh, but you could see how the system's going to work. You could see how the pages, uh, the, you know, the, I likened it to the bowling alley um, bumpers in the gutters. Uh, you'll see how those gutters are in place. Um, you'll see what the email notifications look like. 
from our uh, email notification systems and what an email to you will look like with your compliance officer information. Um, just get a better feel for the system. And I, again, we've not fleshed this out, but I would anticipate that beta testers would receive uh, an email with a URL that contained the initial report pages that Phil went through and the additional information pages would probably have a separate URL you'd be able to follow those URLs. And then there would probably be a um, some sort of survey, like a feedback survey, where you could give us live feedback on each of the pages. And we'll try to figure out how to do that in the most user-friendly way, um, because truly it helps you guys, but it also really helps us because we can beta test this all we want, but you're gonna be the ones that are moving through it. So uh, that's what it means to be a beta tester. Again, in terms of timing, we're looking at July to August of this year on the beta testing system. You would probably have several weeks to go through the system and provide feedback to us. Um, and, you know, again, you guys can always email myself and Phil at the information that's showing up on your screen. All right, do we have any more questions that we missed, Phil, that you're seeing? There are no more questions. All um, right. I do want to thank everyone for participating today, for listening, for being a part of this. Um, uh, it is extremely helpful, um, and like Shelby said, our contact information is here. Um, please feel free to reach out. And uh, just to wrap up, I second Phil's thanks to everybody who attended. We had an overwhelming response on people being excited about being part of this today. You asked great questions. You gave us great feedback. Uh, two things to remember. Number one, if you want these slides, they're downloadable as a handout. Uh, and until I close this webinar, you'll be able to download the PDF of the slides today, and that includes that QR code for beta testing. Uh, you can absolutely email myself and Phil, I second what he said, feedback that you have on today's presentation. And then lastly, there's going to be a feedback survey that pops up on your screen. It's not onerous. It's very quick. It's going to ask you to let us know whether or not you thought today's webinar was useful. You'll rate us one to five stars and then provide any feedback that you would like to provide at that time. It's a free text box that you can um, give us feedback. So today's video, we're gonna edit after the webinar ends. It'll go on our YouTube business education playlist. And for folks that registered, including attendees today and the folks that couldn't make it, they'll get an email with a link to the webinar video. Did I miss anything, Phil? Will the poll at the end of this be anonymous? Yes, it absolutely will. Great question. It is completely anonymous. We can't see who completes it. So feel free to be honest. <laughs> we, we hope you'll be pleasant, but feel free to be honest because that's why it exists. Um, so with that, thank you, everybody. Uh, it was great having you participate and we look forward to beta testing uh, later in the summer and launching a new system late in 2021.